While everyone's getting settled, let me introduce my second panel, um, Dr. Susan Schaefer with Canada's accredited zoos and aquariums. Oh boy, I'm going to try this, Borapat. Um, Dr. Borapat Sidiaruna, did I get it close? With the Zoological Park Association. Dr. Lam Phan with the Southeast Asian Zoo Association and Vietnamese Zoos and Aquariums Association. John Worth with the Pan-African Association of Zoos and Aquaria. And Martin Jordan with the Latin American Association of Zoological Parks and Aquariums. Thank you, Susan. Um, I'm going to start with you, Susan. That is the Susan Chair. You're brand new to the zoo and aquarium community, just a few months, I believe. Um, CASA has had an accreditation program for quite some time, but you came in with fresh eyes, took a new look at it, and I know because we've had a chance to chat that you're thinking of making some pretty radical changes to that. And I'd like I'd love you to tell us where your process is going and what you're thinking about and what you're doing. Thank you very much. I, uh, my background has been in human health care. My background has been in human health care, and uh, so I, I bring a, a view of uh, accreditation from uh, health care institutions as well as health professional uh, education. So bringing that context into looking at the issues that uh, CASA was experiencing, one of the biggest things that I saw was a challenge uh, really from the public uh, to the wards, the credibility of CASA and, and our members um, because of things that we've talked about over the last few days in terms of the bad zoos bringing the good zoos down, uh, transparency, although we have a progressive discipline process, that process is very closed. And so to the media, it looks like we're not doing anything. And there is, of course, a fear of litigation and all of these factors that come in from the challenges that were discussed previously about you know, different types of ownership, whether it's public or private and, and that kind of thing. We've talked a lot about uh, trust uh, over the last few days, and, and implicitly we've talked about uh, a lack of trust, but we haven't actually voiced that. And that is something that, that I could see coming in from outside and especially with uh, even current challenges uh, within Canada. And, for ex and just as an example, um, the City of Toronto uh, is, uh, has always had an exemption for CASA members for program animals going out into facilities and uh, schools and everything for, um, to be able to conduct educational programs. And they've withdrawn that. So the, the challenge they faced was, how are we going to build that trust and credibility back? And um, a lot of it came back to that transparency and openness. And so I, as I started looking, I've discovered that uh, I started looking right back to the ISO standards and the 9,000 and 4,000, 14,000 standards in terms of management and environment. And I came across... Um, uh, an anomaly within the ISO family, which is uh, the Standards Council of Canada. And the anomaly there is that they have actually developed standards for standards development organizations so that we can actually be accredited as a standards development organization. And they use the best practices from across the world in terms of uh, accrediting the processes that we use to actually uh, accredit organizations. So just um, some of the examples uh, in terms of what they, their overarching perspective is, is that they want effective participation by concerned parties. So right now, uh, our committee is a very closed committee. Uh, they are the same committee that sets the standards as, uh, as grants the accreditation based on the inspections. And what happens there is that we uh, originally adopted the AZA uh, standards and then they've modified over time as different regulations have come in place in Canada or as problems arise and we see that the wording is is not appropriate, the language again is not appropriate and we're having things happen that we don't believe should be happening. So uh, it, is t it is a closed group and so in terms of the um, effective participation it would include uh, animal welfare groups, it would include other aspects of, 
uh, outside of the zoo community to bring that perspective. Respect for diverse inter interests, which of course we've had a lot of experience with in the last couple of days. Openness and transparency. Clear development procedures, and that, that is um, one of the key elements of that accreditation process. And avoiding duplication. So uh, as a first step towards that avoiding duplication, we are actually uh, right now doing a gap analysis and looking at uh, CASA's accreditation standards as well as any standards that we can get from, from participating uh, WASA members. Uh, so Greg Terry, who many of you probably know, uh, is actually conducting that gap analysis right now. So when, when we go through that process, it's going to uh, involve technical committees. And so the, the management of the accreditation process and the development of the standards becomes separated. So the technical committees uh, develop the original standards. There is a required uh, public consultation and a required uh, consultation with uh, all affected groups. So if technical committee um, it might create a standard, that standard would go out to the zoos. The zoos would also comment on it as well as any other relevant stakeholders. And then after we have uh, agreement on that, and it's a consensus agreement, although uh, consensus doesn't mean unanimity, so it, there can be differing opinions. And after that, it goes out to a public consultation, uh, which, of course, in this day and age is, is easy to do. Excellent. Thank you. And, and I can say um, on behalf of AZA that, that we've been um, struggling with the issue of transparency as well and, and talking about, I think you're a little further ahead than we are, but we've certainly talked at my board of directors level and at our accreditation commission about different ideas on adding, adding folks from outside of the zoo and aquarium community on our inspection teams. Um, as well as adding folks to our accreditation commission. So I, um, I, I agree with you that this transparency issue is just one of those nuggets we have to figure out while respecting the confidentiality of the process. Uh, I'm going to shift now and, and talk to you, Bora Pat, on I know you and I have talked that you have un used an assessment process in the zoos in Thailand for a while. Talk to me about what you see as the strengths and weaknesses of that process and, and why, and then, and then that's going to pivot nicely, I think, to Dr. Pan on, on, or Dr. Lam on why, why Southeast Asia Zoo Association is considering a new process. Uh, sure. Uh, Thailand is a very small country, and we are just about the size of the state of Texas, but we have probably almost 100 zoos, including roadside and substandard zoos. We are a very small organization, belong to the government, belong to the Ministry of Environment. We only operate in seven zoos, and that's a lot already. And of course, you know, talking about um, animal welfare, we really, you know, in the last 10 years that I have been attending the WASA conferences and my zoo directors that have attended, we embrace animal welfare practices, you know, with open arms. Of course, to be, you know, the proud member of the WASA family. And of course, we need to live up to a lot of high standards. And I cannot agree more when you first started with language matters, because every document is available in English. So we have a big bridge to cross in order to get the message across in terms of advocating our you know, CEOs and board members who has no technical backgrounds or animal backgrounds at all. And that's the biggest challenge for us. And of course, in terms of management on the top level, the board change, the new CEO comes in, you know, it's lack of continuation. And it's a huge challenge on top. The next barrier is, you know, having seven locations, over 600 keepers, 20,000 animals. Of course, it's a lot of work. Um, in order to push this animal welfare agenda forward, I mean, for my organization, we really need a lot of uh, support from the policy, from the management, and of course, at the level of um, human dimension, like Professor Frazier uh, addressed this morning, uh, our people are still, you know, they don't have knowledge where to draw the lines, what is yes and what is no in terms of using animal for visitors' interactions. So we need to start from the current practice 
trying to point out to them what is right, what is not right, and what is non-negotiables. We have a luxury of you know working up with many of the partners within the region, with WASA, attending the conference in Singapore, working with CESA that has you know Dr. Lam as the president, and we started the Animal Welfare Committee and Conservation Committee. I think we are doing well in terms of conservation research in the last 10 years, and we have been focusing our attempts on that. However, on the animal welfare front, I think we are very, very, very young, and we are at the very beginning. You know, we've been hearing a lot of great stuff about you know how great like the Detroit uh, Runs team is doing, and of course, you know, learning from our regional zoo association like ZA or uh, IESA or AZA or at the WAZA when we have a chance. So it's a long way for us to go, but I think the commitment is here because I have my chairman of board of directors with me in this conference. My CEO wanted to come, but he has to bail at the last minute emergency. So I think coming here, I think we learn a lot. The thing is that we are very open. We want, we want it to be as transparent as possible. Our self-assessment for each zoo is twice a year, mandatory. We have a team appointed by the CEO, including university professors, animal welfare group, we invited them to be our auditor. Of course, you know, our self-assessment checklist is translated from any documents available, but we cooked it up based on what is, you know, the latest update. It may only reflect in the performance and physical um, aspect of it and not much of the, you know, effective state of the animals very much, but we are really hoping that we can learn from many of you in this room. So. The weakness, on the other hand, I think um, I already touched on that in terms of seven locations, 600 keepers, 20,000 animals. I mean, everyone is busy, and this is like a, we have to work around people's busy schedule in order to go to visit seven locations twice a year. You, you may be in your infancy, but you're open and willing to learn, and that's the first step. So this is not making this is not about making any of we us feel to, bad about where we, we are to on walk the continuum. We want to walk with you guys. Yes, Dr. Lamb, CESA is in the process of updating your assessment tool. Would you please uh, share with us the process you're going through and how you believe that is going to benefit animal welfare in CESA institutions? Thank you. Just uh, let me uh, talk a little bit about uh, CISA. So CISA is a regional zoo, uh, uh, zoo's organization of uh, Southeast Asian countries. So we have 14 countries in this uh, association. There are 10 ASEAN countries plus uh, Taiwan, Hong Kong, uh, Papua New Guinea, and East Timor. So 14 in the core zone. Uh, CISA also has uh, a committee named uh, Constitu um, Welfare and uh, Ethics Committee, headed by uh, Mr. Willem Manansang from Indonesia. And the uh, vice chair of this committee is Dr. Sumit from ZBO, from his uh, organization. And um, we send many colleagues to the summit in Singapore last year, August. It uh, points out that we are very interested in this uh, uh, development, and we commit to, the, to improving our welfare standards in the member zoos of CESA. Um, after this summit, we, come, uh, we go back and I have a conference, uh, had a conference, uh, CISA conference in uh, Indonesia, and we also talk a lot seriously about welfare and ethics issues. And then uh, in April 2017, we had a training workshop for the CISA uh, members. So many members came to Vietnam, to Phu Quoc, to attend this uh, training workshop. We also invite uh, Wild Welfare, Georgina Allen and Dave Morgan also came. And we invite ZA, ZAA, and Nicholas de Graaf also came to give assistance for training. So this training aimed for um, all the, the uh, CISA members and also uh, for the zoo directors of Vietnam also attend. 
Now we are at the stage of um, creating CISA Animal Welfare Assessment Form, uh, adapting from ZAA, Wild Welfare and Global Assessment Form. We are setting up an animal welfare assessment system, of course our own system, but we learn a lot from other regional associations, such as uh, AZA, ZAA and other associations. Uh, we also um, assigned the committee to focus on the two matters in the near future. The one is a minimum standards for all uh, member zoos. And uh, the second one is annual interactions. So we also have to consider adapting from other association. For example, in, Mas in Masba, in Malaysia, they already have uh, minimum standards for enclosure sizes. So we, uh, maybe we take from them, and also New Zealand, Nicholas de Graaf also told me that the New Zealand also has a system like that. And uh, at the, in the break, uh, break, mo breakfast morning, the day after, the, uh, before yesterday, so we talked with the AZA, AZA also has the, the system. Maybe we, we learn from them and we adapt uh, uh, and modify some uh, numbers for CISA, for using in CISA. Once we set up the minimum standard, each uh, member country can take it and adapt and uh, be their own standards for, the, uh, for, for, for their country. Uh, the, dif uh, the difficulties are in uh, our region is uh, are the cultural differences in 14 countries. And also, also our, the, our traditions are different from Europe or America or Australia that we have to overcome. But uh, uh, in other words, welfare is something very new. Even the word accreditation for us is new. So we, we agree to use assessment and, and certification, right? In Singapore, we don't use accreditation because uh, we translate in, 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 in our language. We cannot understand. So our, our people cannot understand. Even Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, Sing Singapore, they use English. But uh, like Philippines uh, and other countries, they don't understand the, the word accreditation. That's why we use assessment and uh, certification. But we commit to improving welfare standards in our uh, Caesar zoos. That is important. Excellent. And we open to learn from other associations. And uh, we promise to move forward with welfare. Thank you. Thank you. And I, and I would say that uh, you've made a significant amount of progress since our August meeting in Singapore, and we look forward to hearing more. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pivot. I'm hoping to leave enough time for some questions. John, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you, so the Pan-African Association of Zoos and Aquariums, I know you've been using a dual process for assessment and accreditation for a while, uh, and you and I have spoken, and I know that you're making changes to that. Um, you know, what are the challenges that you've faced? And, and explain your program and how you're assessing animal welfare and what changes you're going to be making in the future to your program. Thank you. Thank you. Not normally that I use, use a mic, but good morning. Thank you, Chris. First of all, a great big thank you to Waza and Detroit for the privilege of being able to sit here in this chair and share a time warp with you this morning because I'm going to take you through a 17-year process. Quickly, I hope. <laughs> Three minutes, Chris. Um, PASA, as it's now called, PAYZAB in the original days, had a voluntary accreditation system which date back dates back to the year 2000, based on ISO standards. It quickly became obvious that, you know, it was optional, you didn't have to have it, so 
people weren't going that route. A bold step was taken, a decision was taken at executive level, council level. In 2012, we introduced a compulsory operational standard, which was based on, you would know it in the rest of the world as the South African Bureau of Standards, standard, which links back to VDE and ISO standards. The fear was that by introducing this compulsory standard, we would lose members. We rolled this program out, and I can tell you that five years down the line, the dead opposite has happened. We now have members within Africa applying and wanting to be part of the association, wanting to be part of this world movement. I think one of the biggest differences with us is that all our auditors are ISO 1001 trained. The big difference between the compulsory system and the voluntary system is that the compulsory system focused very heavily on animal husbandry, animal welfare, whereas the accreditation system is on a management process. Africa, being as diverse as it is, we cannot separate the two because what we are finding with the most, I don't know if most of you know, most of the zoos or animal collections in Africa are left over of colonial era. There is no management system. They care for the animals. We are now busy combining, a year ago we were given the go-ahead to combine accreditation and operational standards. This will be presented in two weeks' time to our membership. It will be known as operational accreditation. The big change is that the entry level to this is based 600% on animal welfare, animal husbandry and veterinary. Added to the fact that all our auditors are ISO trained by an external auditor, we are linking with national governments, and I must emphasize this, please folks, if you want to have the recognition, and particularly the colleagues that are going through developing stages, link with your national and in my case, regional legislations, we are now in the very, very fortunate position in South Africa that the National Environmental Affairs has accepted our process, has embraced it, has included it in legislation soon to be come out, and this is a major step forward for us. On the welfare side, from a government perspective, from the National Scientific Authority, we now have a vet that has been employed specifically to look at welfare, has adopted the WASA welfare strategy, and is at our disposal as an association which for me is a fantastic move forward. Great, thank you. Wow, lots of progress all over the world. Martin, you've just, the Latin Association of Zoos and Aquariums has just recently, very recently, launched a new accreditation or assessment program. Could you tell us what part, of how animal welfare uh, is placed in that program and, and kind of explain how you're, how you're implementing it? Okay, what we did in November 2016 was to make available online the standards and how the accreditation process would go, would happen. Uh, we had a little bit of challenge to convince members to go through this process. We haven't done yet the first inspections. This will have, have be happening in October this year. So um, the program focused heavily on safety. Um, even before we can speak about animal welfare, at some of our member facilities, there are quite a few aspects to deal regarding safety. But when we talk about animal welfare, uh, it is focused mostly on some policies and 
protocols regarding nutrition, animal health, and the way that we provide some opportunities and options for the animals to have control over their environment. Yeah. Um, what is a bit challenging for us, OPSA community has 42 members in 13 different countries. A little bit of what we have been hearing from other members, there's a huge uh, range and diversity, range of diversity, and even in some of these countries, the idea of accreditation is not culturally integrated. For example, Cuba being one of those countries. So I think we still have quite a challenges, and for me is to think how we make some of these countries or members to share the values of accreditation, of animal welfare. Um, I'm not sure that it will work just to put pressure on them to accept these ideas. They really need to, to accept them and care for them. Great. Thank you, Marta. Susan, um, so you, John talked a little bit about training program and then the other programs are, are in their nascent stages. What, what kind of training does CASA offer for its accreditation inspectors? Right now, it's, it's uh, I think one of the, the challenges that we have is, is having a standard um, that we can train all of our, our volunteer inspectors on at the same time. So it's something that we are actually working on. Right now, uh, each um, group that is going in to do it, an inspection has a meeting where they try to standardize their approach. Um, many of them have been doing inspections for a very long time. And uh, so I would say that we don't have a formal training program, and that is one of the areas that we need to develop because it's been a very ad hoc um, situation as, as different in, uh, inspections have happened. Great. Um, I'm, I'm looking for Stephanie. Am I, how are we doing on time? Or do you have more questions? You have another question? Just, oh, okay. Accreditation means a zoo can be held accountable against a standard. How do the associations deal with complaints when an accredited zoo is failing to meet that standard? John, do you want to go first? Or should I have ladies go first? Go ahead, John. A very good question that, yes, from my perspective, we do hold, hold them accountable. If it is found that it is a breach of ethics code or any of the codes within the association, we have gone as far as to expel members. So it is not a nice thing to do. The flip side of that is that those members then try their best to get back as quick as possible. Again, I, I appeal to people with, I've heard it here earlier today, is the recognizability, if that's a word, of associations, regional associations, link with your governments, link with your national authorities. Sometimes that's easier said than done. I know. <laughs> Um, Susan, and then Borapat, you can tell, nope, okay, Susan? Uh, well, we have uh, an ethics and compliance committee, and the, uh, uh, any complaint that is made to us, whether it's from the public, whether it's from a staff member, whether it's from uh, another zoo, uh, goes through the first evaluation, and um, if there's any um, evidence to indicate that we should be proceeding, it goes through a formal process through the committee. And then we have a progressive disciplinary process where um, at first we go out and we um, attempt to mediate the difficulty that maybe it is a language issue, maybe it is um, a not understanding or something like that. So we try to mediate that first. Um, if we have attempted to do that and then we have uh, further problems, then we send out a formal letter from uh, the chair of the Ethics and Compliance Committee. Um, then uh, if we still have problems or 
if we deem that the problem is significant enough and that um, the first step can be um, skipped over because of other things that have happened, we'll go directly to a membership suspension. And that can be up to a year. And um, it can be as little as six months. And then uh, through that process, if it's a six months or a year, then we try to get the, the member back up to a standing where they can uh, continue. And after that, if there still continues to be problems, then the membership is terminated. So from the AZA perspective, um, we say that accreditation is for five years. However, comma, um, if we get a complaint uh, about a member institution, depending upon the nature of that complaint, well, we'll always go back to the institution, ask them for proof, documentation, evidence of whatever the complaint is. Got it. I see I have one minute. Um, and then depending upon the nature of the response, the nature of the complaint, we have and we will send in a team to do an inspection. Uh, and we have denied accreditation during, during that five-year time period. So an institution's, uh, an institution's accreditation could be denied after just a year if there's some serious, serious issue. There are some um, triggers within the AZA accreditation process that require an immediate inspection by a team. Um, certainly if a member of staff or a visitor is killed. Um, and then if we look at you know, if there's a series of, of issues. But it sounds to me like our processes are, are fairly similar. Uh, Martin, is there in understanding that you've not gone through the process yet? Can you share with us briefly what's involved in your process once an institution is accredited? Is there a complaint process, and what would you do if an institution were failing to meet those standards? Thank you. Um, even though we don't have the accreditation program yet implemented in the sense that no facilities has been accredited, we have had complaints. And what we have done, and it's probably what we will do with our program, is that we ask our member to give us a full report, explain what happened. Um, usually this report will go to our board. Our board will have some questions. Um, depending on what the issue is, um, there will be a decision of whether they keep being members or not. If it is something that um, can be improved, we will ask what will you do to avoid having this situation again. And we will ask evidence of the implementation of those measures. So this is likely the same that will happen with our accreditation program. Great. All right, will you all please help me thank my second group of panelists, Susan Borapat, Dr. Lamb, John, and Martin. Enjoy your lunches, and I believe we're back here at 115, but check your program. Don't count on me. <laughs>